The engine of a car is kind of like a computer's operating system. It's the brains of the car, especially when it's a new Corvette, which has 11 microprocessors under the hood. But when you go shopping for a new car, you don't care about the details of how the engine works. You want to know how well the car performs, how fast does it go, how well does it handle. The same when you buy a new computer. You may not care about the details of the operating system, but that sure will affect the way the computer works. Today, we take a look at a new operating system, the new engine under the Macintosh hood, System 7, on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you it's a federal offense to copy software. Additional funding is provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, mail order software and hardware peripherals for the PC and the Macintosh, and by Byte Magazine and VIX, the Byte Information Exchange. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and with me this week is Tim Bahar, an Executive Vice President with Creative Strategies, Inc., and Tim, one of the most frequently quoted experts in the computer field. Tim, what we have up here on the computer is a new generation word processor. It's called MacWrite Pro from Claris, and you can see it looks more like a desktop publisher. Right. It's a beta version. It's not out yet as a product, but it runs under System 7, and that's the point. And uh, for instance, here's just one of the nice little features that it uses from System 7, uh, the help balloon. So once I click on show balloons, no matter what I point to, instantly I get a little balloon helping me and explaining what that does. What's the title bar? Okay, that's that. If I forget, what does that little thing do? It says, well, you click on it to zoom. Click right now if you want to zoom. And it does, a very nice feature. When we talk about operating systems from the end user's point of view, right. I don't deal very much directly with the operating system. I use applications. And I want to know what kinds of improvements, what, what kinds of new features in the applications will I find that run under System 7? Well, first of all, this particular uh, application where you are able to have these title bars and yeah. any of these things zoom up on you makes it easier to use. They also have something in System 7 that's really important called the Inter-Application Communications System, yeah. which allows me to take information and share it between between documents and applications. Mm. And that really enhances my ability to have information at my fingertips. Well, Tim, today we're going to be joined by the System 7 product manager who will show us some of the new features of System 7. And we'll look at two of the brand new applications that run under the new Mac operating system, the spreadsheet program Resolve and the new drawing program called Canvas. Well, the bottom line question you want answered is should I spend the time and money to convert to System 7? Well, we visited the computer center at Stanford University to find out what the techies there think. Stanford University had a year's head start with System 7. As an alpha and beta test site, computer specialists at Stanford have spent a lot of time working with System 7's new features, and the reviews are generally good. Probably the biggest feature we've been using here at Stanford is the file sharing. That's also the single biggest reason why we're seeing people move to System 7 is so that they can do file sharing, either in their office or across the campus network. It, it adds a lot of functionality without being really intrusive about the way it changes the environment. It's kind of a, a nice gradual change. I do a lot of writing and teaching and training materials, so I need to have a lot of things at my disposal, and it really speeds up my work and really improves my productivity. The Mac users at Stanford are obviously enthusiastic about System 7, but nothing is perfect. One complaint is that System 7 is not compatible with older versions of Mac software. Almost everyone I've seen install System 7 had to do some type of cleanup work. They had to get rid of really old applications or their favorite games that they'd been playing for five years that just didn't work under the new operating system. And Stanford programmer Peter Tuttle says System 7 is not too good when it comes to copying disks. It's read the source, it's asked you for the target, it's almost to the end of, of copying. It makes you put the source back in and then the target back in one last time. And I can't believe, I have a lot of memory here, I can't believe that it, I, well I just don't know why it does that, but it seems unnecessary. With over 5,000 Macs on campus, Stanford has a lot of work to do to make the transition to System 7. But the computer experts here seem to think it's worth it. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel.
Joining us now is the product manager for System 7 at Apple, Steve Goldberg, known there as the 7.0 guy. Hi, Stuart. And next to Steve, Craig Danieloff, who's probably the only guy who knows as much about 7.0 as you do. Craig is the author of the System 7 book, which just came out. Tim? When I go to install System 7 on my machine, it has various levels of compatibility. Uh, it, sometimes it says that a program is not compatible. Should I be concerned? For application programs, for the most part, no, because you can just simply test that after you install System 7. What you should pay attention to is the part of the compatibility checker that wants to move incompatible inits and control panels, because those, those can cause System 7 problems at startup. Okay. Steve, we're eager to see what System 7 can do, so show us. Well, System 7 is Apple's new version of Macintosh system software, and we are really striving for a greater simplicity and sophistication. I want to show you a few demonstrations that highlight some of those mm -hmm. themes. First is how you install fonts in the system. Under System 7, it's really natural to just take a font and be able to drag it onto the system folder, and that's exactly how it works to install a font. The system recognizes the font, goes ahead and installs it. Much different than the past. Right. Yes. Uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with the old font DA mover, and this is uh, definitely a big step forward in just uh, new level of simplicity. Mm -hmm. So now you go and you see that the font's already installed, and I can use it right away. Another way that system has um, been made easier to use is through an integrated find command. It used to be a separate utility, right. and that's now been built in. So if I want to find a file, I come to the find command under the file menu. It brings up a really simple dialog box where I can type the name of the file I want to find, saying that's lost mm -hmm. in this, for this example. Click find. And not only does it tell me where it is, but you see it also fetches it there on the screen. If it's not the right one, I can say find again, and it'll go ahead and walk down the list. Now, if I want to think, find things in more sophisticated ways, there's uh, a more choices button, which brings up an expanded mm -hmm. version. I can search for things in a whole sure. wide variety of ways. Now, as people work with larger hard drives and more files, it's really important to have very powerful navigation and location tools. And you saw find. Another one is saying uh, in System 7 is the customizable Apple menu. And let me show you how that works. Suppose I have a couple of documents and applications that I use uh, every day, very, very frequently. Mm -hmm. What I can do is I can take those, in this case I have Microsoft Word and a to-do list, a document, and place those inside the special folder. Just drag it in. Just drag it in, and immediately you see that they show up in the Apple oh. menu. And so there's Microsoft Word and there's the to-do list. Yeah. And when I select it, it goes ahead and opens it up. And that's very convenient because I literally have one-stop shopping for my most frequently used documents and applications and folders and so on. Mm -hmm. It's very, very convenient. And of course, you see fairly lengthy Apple menus now. Now, what about file sharing? That's been something that we always use. Yeah, file sharing is uh, what, I, what I consider to be one of the most important new features in System 7. It's one that customers over and over talk about. What file sharing is is the ability to share your files and folders with other people across the network, and it replaces the infamous you know, sneaker right, net. Right. <laughs> Let me show you how that works. Here I have a folder on my machine, and it has a couple of different files in it. And what I can do is come up to the file menu and say sharing. A little box comes up. I'll click share this item. These other controls have to do with security and so on. We can talk about those later if you want. And now you notice that this folder gains a new icon and it shows a little network wires. And that gives me a clue that's available across the network. Now on Tim's machine over here. And let's make clear, this is a separate computer here, separate not computer just another monitor. Yeah. And they're connected via network. In right. this case, I'm using phone net. And I can come up and tell it that I want to access files off someone else's machine by clicking on this icon. And I see my machine, Steve's 2CI, this one, across mm -hmm. the network. And in this case, I'll just say I'm a guest and click OK. And now I see the shared folder from, that we shared on this machine. And let me just send this away. And you'll see that a new icon here has been added right, to the right, desktop. Machine, yeah. And if I open up that icon, what I see inside of it are the exact same files from this machine. In fact, I have a view, if you will, onto this hard drive. Yeah. And I can go ahead and open up uh, one of the documents work on it, make some changes, and save it back onto my machine. So for small groups of people, I have a very, very effective mm -hmm, tool mm -hmm. for taking advantage of that wire, which connects all my Macintoshes to my laser writer, and sharing files and folders with other people. What else do you? Well, the last thing I want to show you is how we provide some new growth opportunities for applications through something called inter-application communications. And the one thing I want to show you is something called publish and subscribe. And what publish and subscribe allows you to do let me just go ahead and get a couple things set up here. What Publish and Subscribe allows you to do is share parts of your documents with other documents, either on the same machine or across the network. And whenever you change data in one document, it automatically updates 
other documents. Even in different applications. Either in different applications. And what I have here on my machine is the new version of Excel mm -hmm. 3.0, which supports this feature. And on the other machine is an upcoming version of WordPerfect, which also supports it. So what I can do is I can select some numbers, or in this case a chart, come up to the edit menu, a standard new command called create publisher, where I can come in and name uh, the link and place it somewhere. I'll say go ahead and publish. And on, then on this machine, Tim's machine, what I can do is I can issue the counterpart command, which is called subscribe. subscribe. So I'll come up to the edit menu, say subscribe to, and here I'll, I'll see a list of all the different things, and I'll say subscribe. And you see that it places a copy of the mm -hmm. data into that application. And now the beauty of this is that those documents are linked together. And if I change data in one document, suppose the sales go from 10 to 70, mm -hmm. and you see it changes there. When I save that document, it will tell the other document across the network to update. And this can take, take some, a, couple between a couple seconds. But take a look at the chart on the other side, and you, and you will see it update. There we go. There it is. OK, and if I can ask you to uh, sure. give the keyboard over to Craig. Uh, Craig, go. we have a couple minutes left. Uh, tell us about a couple of your favorite features of System 7. All right, well, the first thing I'll show is a new feature, an ability of the finder called aliasing. Uh -huh. And this allows you to make a duplicate of any icon and place that duplicate in a different place from the original file. A common use of this, of this is to make it easier to launch applications. Uh, most people's hard drives are filled with different programs and they're all buried in different subfolders. What I've done here is alias all of the application mm -hmm. files themselves, kept place them in a file I keep on the desktop, and to get to any of my programs now, I can just click on the alias. Yeah. Now, when it's I, linked directly to the actual application. Right, that alias icon is only taking up 1K of disk space. When I run that, the Macintosh System 7 is launching the actual application. There it is, right. Another way to use aliases is to store files in different places. I might have uh, all my letters I sent out in February in one folder, the same files sorted by the people they were sent to, and so forth. But files aren't the only thing you can alias. You can also alias m items on other hard drives. For example, when Steve showed uh, connecting to the Macintosh LC right there, he had to use the chooser and enter the username and the password right. and so forth. After I do that, I can simply create an alias of that remote volume and mount it by simply double clicking. Mm. So I save the step right, of going right. through the chooser. Now what about virtual memory? That's another real important fe fe feature of System 7. Right, virtual memory uh, is one of two new memory features on System 7, and what it allows you to do is use space on your hard drive as RAM to save money uh, in terms of avoiding buying extra <laughs> RAM, and also it allows you to have more memory for if you just need it once in a while. I'll turn virtual memory on in this machine as well as 32-bit addressing, and I'll need to restart in order to make that take effect. And what's going to happen after uh, the Mac reboots is, in this case, there's 8 megs of memory in the CI, so I'll go up to 13. If I only had 4 megabytes of memory and I wish I had 8, that would, that would be how it would set up. All right, so what's going to happen now, Craig? The Macintosh is going to restart and it's going to follow my instructions in the memory control panel and take some hard drive space and pretend that it's RAM. Mm -hmm. So I'll have effectively 13 megabytes of RAM when I restart. The 32-bit addressing button that I clicked allows me to go past that standard 8 megabyte right. limit. Can you show us real quick what it's done? Sure. What we'll see is in the About the Finder right. dialog box, I will Right, right. I'm informed that my built-in memory is 8 megs, but I've got a total of 13 available. And with that 13 now, I could launch a variety of applications and switch between them very easily using the new uh, ability to hide. Craig, Steve, thanks a lot. Well, there is another platform out there called DOS, and Microsoft has also just come out with an upgrade to the PC's operating system called DOS 5.0. How good is it? We got one answer from a small business user in South San Francisco. 2143. This is Congressional Business Systems, a small company with only uh, five employees right and one 386 PC. They were running Windows under DOS 4.01, but when 5.0 came out, operations manager Jeff Goulet rushed right out to get it. DOS 5.0 has certain features that were not available in 4.01, like the undelete feature, uh, unformatting, things like that that were really helpful. Okay, what this shows is how much memory is available with DOS 5. Uh, I have 623K available out of a possible 640K. Uh, all of that memory is available for my executable programs. 
Another feature that Goulet likes about 5.0 is its improved ability to manage memory resident programs. Certain programs like WordPerfect would not run with other TSRs and uh, I'd have to unload those before I could run those programs. A new command for DOS 5.0 is DOS key, which is a command line editor. It keeps a history of the last approximately 4K of commands that you've used. So if you previously had accessed your uh, word processor, uh, you can go back into the last commands that you used and you can execute those commands just by searching for it and then pressing return to uh, load that command. One of the common problems with a new operating system is the installation, but Goulet says DOS 5.0 is very easy to install. The installation that comes with DOS 5.0 is seamless. Uh, you put the disks in, read the screens, follow what it says, and it makes all the appropriate changes for you. It's a lot like the Windows setup in that it makes the appropriate changes for you. There's very minimum that you need to do to tweak it into shape. And what does Goulet think about Windows compared to the Mac? I think Windows is here to stay. It's got a lot of great features. Uh, features that the Macs just can't do. Uh, I'm used to the PCs. I've worked with the Macs. I like the, the PCs better. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. Back to the Mac and a look at two new applications that utilize the power of System 7. Here to show us Resolve is Brian McDonnell of Claris Software and next to Brian Doug Levy of Deniba Software. Tim? System 7 has another set of features known as Apple Events. Can you show that how, us how that works in any application? Sure, I'll show you within Claris Resolve, our new spreadsheet. And there's a lot you can do while you're in the spreadsheet, but suppose you want to take advantage of that from within another application. I have an example here of being in HyperCard right. down in the foreground here with a lot of information you might have. And what I want to do is send Apple events directly into Resolve and have Resolve do some charting on these numbers. So the first thing I'll do is connect into Claris Resolve and use the uh, standard browser that comes with the system software and say that I want all my Apple event messages go to go right to Claris Resolve. Now when I click these other buttons in the HyperCard stack, such as Send, I can send events directly over to Resolve in the background. We can see the window coming up and all the numbers coming directly in from this foreground information. But with two more buttons, I can really take advantage of Resolve's power in the background while I'm at HyperCard. The Format button uh, allows you to get out all the formats Resolve does, right. changing the, the font styles and spacing. And there's a lot you can do with color, so it'll resize these columns so they'll look like a nice report and add a little color into them. And then it gets rid of some of those interface elements I might not want in my finished report. Now I have all the color there and the formatting. And uh, I can also use all of Resolve's charting power directly here from within HyperCard. So I can clip, click on a button to do charting, and you can see all those messages going to the background. And the way this works is Resolve has a real powerful programming language, but the user doesn't have to worry about that. Just in HyperCard, you can click buttons that send these messages right over to, to Resolve. So there we go. We've got a chart in the background as well. Mm -hmm. Now, what else about Resolve would be unique to running under System 7 and taking advantage of it? Well, there's a lot you can do where you support the full set of uh, System 7 features. Publish and subscribe might be one of the most interesting. If you have someone working on your network who has all the financial data and you're trying to get a report done, you can subscribe to the latest data and you don't have to worry about how long it takes them to find all the, all the yeah, numbers. Yeah, they just come yeah, over as soon yeah. as they get them. All right, Doug, Brian has been showing us kind of serious business applications here, Resolve, Spreadsheet, that kind of stuff. You've got Canvas, a draw program that's got a lot of creativity and new tools built into it. First of all, how does Canvas take advantage of the System 7 platform? Canvas is a System 7 savvy program, which means it not only supports the core Apple events, uh, but a number of custom uh, Apple events for voice applications, such as uh, the Voice Navigator 2. Uh, we have sophisticated balloon help. Not only the publish and subscribe, and we have uh, dynamic true type font manipulation capabilities. All right, show us a little bit of Canvas and demo some of its features. Sure. Type takes on a whole new meaning in Canvas. By simply typing some uh, text, mm -hmm. we can uh, then uh, grab the text and scale it to exactly uh, fill the screen. Real time scaling. Real time yeah. scaling. And then I have a path on screen by taking the two, I can then bind the text to any path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll delete the path at this time. 
and uh, reselect the text. And this time I'm going to uh, transform the text into its Bezier outline. Mm -hmm. And I'll put a uh, little fill in there so that I can come up and then apply some color. In this case, it's a gradient color. That's correct, yeah. a gradient fill. I'll group them all together and apply one of the many special effects available to objects in Canvas, such as a two-point perspective. Hmm. Just going to pull it out there, huh? Just pull it out. Let me see. Hmm. Another uh, one of uh, Canvas's uh, features is the ability to flow text around objects. People uh, create objects in, a, uh, in an illustration, and they may want to add some text. So now Canvas simply allows you to select the objects and the text block and quickly and easily flow the text around any number of objects. Mm -hmm. But not only can you do that, we've got uh, tremendous typographical control in Canvas. Uh, I can uh, stick the cursor in between the X and the T and dynamically kern the uh, character or double click for the word, kern the word, triple click for the line, or take the entire text block and kern mm -hmm. the characters of text. Oh. Now some programs allow you to transform the shape of objects from one to another uh, using two objects. However, in Canvas, we've uh, released the, the limit and will allow you to combine any number of objects uh, simultaneously. Let's say 100 intermediate shapes between the objects. And Canvas will not only take the shape of one object, but all of the properties, the color, the fill pattern, and blend them from one to another to another to another so you can create some very interesting effects, the key being productivity for uh, the user. Mm -hmm. And uh, once a user gets done with his application, uh, with his document, he may want to uh, replay the, the document back as, a, as an on-screen presentation. So Canvas will allow you to come back in and show you, uh, your slides uh, as a, mm -hmm. a screen presentation. We have about a minute left, and Brian, I want to go back to you to talk about Apple events. You went mm -hmm. through that very, very quickly. And for someone who's new to System 7, explain again what you do with Apple events in an application like yours. Sure, sure. Some of the System 7 events are very intuitive. IAC would sound like it's something a little bit more complex. Yeah. But Apple events is really a pretty simple idea. Before, applications have always been standalone, a spreadsheet that you just work within there. But with Apple events, applications can now send messages back and forth mm -hmm. and talk to other applications. So what I was doing from HyperCard was having HyperCard send little messages over to Resolve and say, here's some data I want you to have, and then send another message and say, chart that data. Right. So you can have a spreadsheet as a charting and analytical engine right. behind other applications. Got it, got it. Okay, that helps. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. That's our look at System 7. Stay tuned now for this week's computer news on Random Access. In the random access file this week, WordPerfect is finally shipping its new WordPerfect for Windows. The retail price is $495, but any current WordPerfect user can upgrade for just $99. The latest version of WordPerfect contains all the familiar WordPerfect features, but has a totally new graphic user interface that works under Windows and makes many WordPerfect commands available by simply clicking on screen icons. Microsoft has unveiled a new multimedia version of Works for Windows. The new upgrade of the popular popular integrated package uses digital sound, animation, and graphics in the tutorial to make it easier to train new users. Borland has announced three new object-oriented software tools for Windows, all based on the C++ language. The entry-level product is Turbo C++ for Windows, priced at $149. The high-end product is Borland C++ and Application Frameworks 3.0. That package takes up to 28 megabytes of hard disk space. Adobe Systems has announced version 2.0 of Adobe Type Manager. The upgrade of ATM provides better printer support, offers font rendering at twice the speed of the original version, and also simplifies the process of font installation. The OS2 operating system may seem irrelevant these days, but it looks like more people may soon be using OS2 on a daily basis than any other operating system. NCR has announced that it's replacing all its automated teller machines with new 386-based PCs running OS 2. 
NCR says it picked the 386 platform running OS2 because of its ability to handle multi-threading and multitasking in a high security environment. Apple Computer says it has just closed a deal to sell Macintosh computers in Poland. Apple has just signed a distribution agreement with SAD Limited, which will set up a reseller network. Apple has also sold a million dollars worth of Macs to the Polish Ministry of Education for use in the Polish school system. Here are this week's top selling software titles for the Macintosh according to Mac Connection. Symantec's Think Reference is now the number one seller, followed by Quicken, the two latest After Dark products, and the new Microsoft Flight Simulator. Also in the top 10 this week, Norton Utilities for the Mac, Disk Doubler, the Now Utilities, SAM, and Excel. The General Accounting Office says hackers in Europe were able to crack the Defense Department's computer system during the Persian Gulf War. The GAO says hackers in Holland entered the DOD system using commercial systems like TimeNet to get into government systems like Internet. The GAO says no military operations were compromised and the information accessed was unclassified. Intel has unveiled its new supercomputer called the Paragon XPS and its power is hard to comprehend. It can perform 300 billion calculations per second using 4,000 microprocessors. The XPS technology will eventually improve the performance of the personal computer. This machine is a tremendous advance in terms of hardware and software. It will drive Intel's growth not only at the high end, but there will be a tremendous trickle-down effect into its smaller systems based on the i860 chip. Intel is already working on a teraflop computer for 1995. A teraflop is one trillion operations per second. If you're looking for a high-speed computer printer, you may already have one if you own a Kodak copy machine. Kodak has announced a new network interface product that will turn the newest model Kodak copiers into printers that can output 50 pages per minute. And finally, the American Optometric Association says that doctors are treating more than 8 million patients a year for VDT-related eye problems. The optometrists say the situation can be improved with anti-glare filters, better glasses, and improvements in the work environment. And that's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Maria Gabriel. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you it's a federal offense to copy software. Additional funding is provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, mail order software and hardware peripherals for the PC and the Macintosh, and by Byte Magazine and VIX, the Byte Information Exchange. Video cassette copies of this program are available. Computer Chronicles also publishes a companion newsletter containing details on products demonstrated, plus background information on program topics. To order a video cassette or a subscription to the newsletter, call 1 800 366 9484 or write Computer Chronicles. Please specify program subject for tapes. All orders include a free software program for auditing software use.